do you think it might be better for you to sit here so your voice is projecting that way? If you don't mind? Sorry. All right, well, I want to welcome everyone this evening. My name is Maureen Zhang. I'm the public programs coordinator here at the museum. And um, it's been an honor for us to have this exhibition of Sidra's work. And we're very delighted to have everyone here tonight. We think of this as a, sort of a, a more of a celebration. It's a happy event. We're cel we want to celebrate Sidra's work and Sidra's life and the impact that she has had on so many other artists uh, in the in the Pittsburgh region and, and around the world. And um, even those who were, who were not artists, who again were influenced by Sidra. I don't think I can tell you too, tell you too much about Sidra. Um, She's, we would kind of claim her as a local girl because she was educated here at Seton Hill. I know she was born in Utah and uh, practiced her craft in Pittsburgh. Her CV is uh, extensive. She's had numerous awards, including the Vivian Lehman Award for Portraiture, um, the Fulbright Hayes Group Project, and uh, been honored by the Andy Warhol Museum. Her work has been shown, again, in many venues, the Jew American Jewish Museum, the Three Rivers Arts Festival, the Manchester Craftsman's Guild, and um, just like I said, too many galleries in Pittsburgh to even mention them all. Uh, she was recently featured as the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Um, so we're really honored to have this work by Sidra, and this evening we've invited several of Sidra's friends, although they are many and we can fill an auditorium just with them, uh, but to talk about her work, uh, this work in particular, her work in general, and how it has impacted them. We have, um, now they, now I've got to get them in a different order than I have them on my page, but this is <laughs> Seal Leeper Sturdivan. Uh, Seal has a, uh, a bachelor's in art education, uh, a bachelor's and a master's actually in art education. She is the clay and art instructor at the Ellis School. She's taught a number of public schools and art centers in Pittsburgh, and her work has been exhibited again throughout the region and as far away as China. Uh, next to her, Laura DeFazio. Uh, Laura is primarily a sculptor, a sculptor, and she draws large-scale works, often for public spaces. Uh, she works a lot in stone and cast cement, but she's also worked in a variety of media. Uh, right now, she is, in addition to all of her artwork, she's a professor in the Department of Art and Design at California University. Uh, she's been there since 1997. Uh, her degree, she has a bachelor's from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and her master's from Kent State. And then next to her is Priscilla Van Steele Robinson. She's currently the president of the Society of Sculptors, as well as the Guild Exhibition Committee Chair at the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts. Priscilla also studied at Kent State. I think you know that connection. So, Kent State alums there next to each other. Uh, she's also worked in a number of media, ceramics, collage, charcoal. Uh, but for a number of years, her work focused on abstract pieces created from plywood. But currently, she's working on installation pieces that uh, function as a form of meditation and prayer for empowerment of women and world peace. So they obviously, the sculpture is their, their common connection here. With us this evening, we're honored to have Sidra's mom, Verna Robinson, uh, Sidra's husband, Carl Bonner. Wave your hand, Sidra. <laughs> and where's Aunt Edna? And Edna is well, uh, Annie Edna's right here. Yeah, Badger, she's back in the room. We've got video cameras everywhere. <laughs> and Edna's back in the corner here. So uh, Priscilla and Laura work on the uh, the Prayer to, of the Dove exhibition. It's the installation that's on the opposite side of the building next to our studio. So I think if everyone uh, hasn't had a chance to see that, make sure you stop and see that at the end of uh, the evening. It was a, their tribute to Sidra. So it's as Joe mentioned, this is Joe McGarry, our Director of Education here at the Museum. This is a, we want everybody to feel comfortable. Uh, if you want to get, a, if you want to move up, I'll get some folding stools as we get started here. So if you want to move up to hear better, you want to grab another beverage or grab another snack as the evening goes on. We want everyone to sort of feel relaxed like this is, we, it's like our little living room here. So and we invite you in to share their thoughts and your thoughts about Sidra. So I'll let Joe get started. Well, thank you, everyone. And first of all, I'm relieved we fit everybody in so far. Uh, I knew we'd have a fairly big turnout. Sidra has been an incredible draw here at the museum. We've had a steady flow of people coming through, looking at her art, and really appreciating it in a way that I think she'd have been very moved by. And um, just the most positive reactions, nothing negative, of 
at all, and people very, very moved by it. Um, I'm actually going to start with being a little personal about Sidra, and then we'll talk more about her work, and then we'll end being more personal about Sidra. And one of the things that struck me is when you met Sidra for the very first time, it's a memory that's burned on your retinas. She made <laughs> such an incredible... She used to sign off emails with sunshine, and she burned bright like the sun. And I'm going to ask everybody on our panel to kind of share with us the first time they met Sidra and the impact that alone had on her before they really got to know her even better. Um, as a teacher, um, Sidra was so passionate, and her students were so lucky to have her. I mean, and that's how I met her. We met at um, conferences that our schools would get together. And Sidra and I, well, I especially, would always move my seat to make sure that I could sit right next to her. Because not only um, did she have good educational com comments, she also had a lot of fun comments about <laughs> what was going on. <laughs> so we'd have a good time when things got boring. But um, she just sparkles. Um, she hugs, similar to her mother. It's wonderful <laughs> to hug her mother because it feels a little bit the same, so you, you can feel her. Um, but she just, she was amazing. But that's when I first met her. I met her then, then we taught ceramics, and then the Unitarian Church, where she was lovely with my family and my um, overactive daughter when she was young. Sidra accepted her and loved her, and um, I will never forget, and my daughter will never forget. Um, I I met Sidra at the Clay Place at a show, and it was either the winter of 90, it was either December of 97 or January of 98, but it was the winter of the first year that I moved back to Pennsylvania, and you're right, it is kind of unforgettable. I remember her moving through the room, and I don't remember if she was wearing a fur coat or something very sensual, but she was just, she was just stunning walking through the room, and we started talking about clay. We started talking about um, clay recipe and Tom Taylor clay recipe, and um, we started talking about the work, and it was just very really <coughs> unexpected to meet somebody just, who had such an enormous presence and just start talking about, you know, the really cool stuff about the art, and, um, and that's, you know, we kind of became friends that, that night. That's it. Um, but the first time I remember seeing Sidra was at the opening at the Jewish Community Center, and her piece was there, and we both had received a award that night, and, but I, I don't remember formally being introduced to Sidra that night, but Laura had, um, Laura and I are on the board for the Society of Sculptors, and Laura kept telling me about Sidra, and saying I had to meet Sidra and so we got Sidra to come to the board meetings and to act as secretary. And, <laughs> and, and Sidra was such a delight. She, um, as soon as I had agreed to become the president of the Society of Sculptors, she cheered and so it was like, you know, Sidra, she just really embraced me and all of us and was um, just such a delight to have part of our group and our family. I assume I could bypass Bernard. We probably all know how she felt the first time. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, uh, Verda has lots to add. We, we all got together on Sunday to talk because we were going to be doing this together. And we're kind of hoping that we're, we're going to relive that here with you all because it was just an amazing conversation. And everybody jumped in other things to add. So that's how it's going to be. It won't be moving down the line anymore. Hopefully they'll dive on in. <laughs> but I wanted us to now look at the theme of tonight's get together and the concept of struggling toward utopia because utopia is something that Sidra wrote about quite a bit. It comes up in her artwork. And I wanted you to just read quickly um, from one of the earlier mentions, 2005, uh, the Mandorla egg with almond cross pattern and woman. Um, and make sure you go around and look at all of this stuff again. Uh, but she said, part of my mission as an artist is to make utopian art. 
art that provides hope and envisions solutions to our confusion and pain, which I think is really broad, and I know that we're going to discuss some of the other aspects of that, but um, just hitting on the humanitarian aspect of that utopian ideal, and a little later we'll get to the feminist utopian ideals. But I, I wanted to get all of you kind of talking about, you know, how you feel Sidra was striving towards that utopia in her art and in her life, in her writings. Okay, so take it away. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> take it away. I, I think you have to start with Sidra at the very, very beginning, when she began to have an awareness of herself as a young woman. And she also mentions this in her writings, that, and it was mentioned at the memorial service if you were there. Um, I was just talking to with some dear friends who went to the same church that Sidra went to as a young girl. And Sidra was constantly pushing, pushing the boundaries, even then. <laughs> and she talks about the day that she wrote on the wall, took paper cutouts of letters, and put on the wall, pray to God, she loves you. <laughs> well, this did not go over very well with the uh, people in the church. And uh, the one young man who was teaching the Sunday school class told me later on, he said, she was constantly challenging my theology. So I think, I think from the beginning, if you want to think about Sidra, she's always been pushing and pushing and pushing. And as her life evolved, marrying Carl, having children, she began to realize that if anything was going to happen of any good, it would have to be men and women working together. And so that God is male and female, God is beyond male and female, and she could embrace that now. And uh, I think that for me is where um, I saw her feminism start and um, just continue and evolve and grow and really come to a very, very beautiful culmination in not only her art, but in her marriage to Carl and her uh, being a mother to Kathy. She's a hard act to follow. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, I'll 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 add on to that that I think that um, what you said about with you know her marriage and having uh, Kevin, um, I think that, and you can see it in her art too. I think that she strove towards a type of 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 wholeness in everything that she did, and so in the art, you know, you see many different visions of front and back, different views of things. But in her life, I think she also um, really strove to see many points of view and see how they all fit into the whole. And I think that, that that is something that sort of resonated throughout her personality. Her early work, I remember, um, she did the Minoan um, snake goddesses. And she did a lot of different type of um, coloring on it and details. Um, Sidra was fabulous with color and texture and tiny designs, but she, at the beginning, she felt a need for color. And a lot of times, um, early on, before this work, we would sit down and talk about glazes and underglazes and um, uh, different ways to do surface treatments. And they were beautiful, but the rawness, I think, projects more of the just out there. I don't think there needs to be any color or, you know, any the, of that essence. the essence. I think it's just so raw and it, it is raw and it, it her work now is just so in your face and makes you really think it's there's nothing hidden behind like a costume which would be maybe the underglaze or the color or whatever. It's just there. So there was a great train change of surface treatment. To the better. Yeah, and you know, you're talking about her art, but in her life also. Um, Sidra used to say that her favorite thing to do, sometimes we would, you know, just talk about whatever. Um, and uh, my dog was always at our side, and she loved my dog, and I adore my dog. And she used to say her favorite thing to do was to watch Kevin play. And um, they go to the beach. She couldn't say this to me because he was a kid. But 
her favorite thing to do is just to watch. In the whole world, there was nothing that made her happier than watching her son. I don't think there was anything that, that made her happier than being married to Carl and having Cabin and getting to be a wife and a mother and a woman in all of the dimensions that she got to express herself. And I think, I think that's, I think that's all, you know, part of it. I want, I want to comment on the utopian art here. Um, I think when you, when you look at Sidra's art, you have to, she always said, you can't look at just my art, you have to look at my words. You have to take the words and the art. The words are the left side of my brain, the art is the right side of my brain. And again, in utopia, it's the coming together, the, the yin and the yang, the male, the female, the opposites. And I think the power of Sidra's art is that what she does is as you walk around, you will see the different facets of her. And don't we all have different facets? We're not, we're not just one aspect of, you know, you know, people may only see one aspect, but we know down deep in our hearts that we're very multifaceted. And she allowed herself to express through her art these many issues um, as she was dealing with death she was dealing with life um, so you see her holding on to life grabbing life and then death and trying to hold death at bay uh, in one of the other art uh, in one of the other pieces um, the determination uh, I'm sure Carl you had some uh, 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 what is it I say? Participation in naming that because you love puns. D, not, termination, death, ending. D, termination, against termination. And in that particular one, look at that and you will see three aspects of Sidra. One of them is male. And the male aspect of herself. And then as these things are coming out of her mouth, her legacy, the legacy or the voice of these different aspects of herself are coming out. And I think if we think about utopia, we have to bring all of the ideas together, both within ourselves and within each other. And, um, and that, that was her goal, was to men and women working together and um, and actually, I, I'm, I'm going to open it back up to you, but I want to add something, and that was why I was looking through here. But you said multifaceted, and each work is multifaceted, but also her working method was, because she worked on more than one sculpture at a time, and you can read that in her readings, and, and the two that kind of jumped into my mind as you were talking was um, the creation story and which church, which church, which were both sculpted on at the same time and she you you know if you don't have a copy of this we have plenty of them take time to read it and to look at the sculpture but she talks very elegantly about how the works speak to each other but the way in which she treats them and the ideas that strike her come out in both and it's it's also that there's the creation story is that utopian ideal you have men and women working together to create life and harmony and then you have which church which is the opposite of that. It talks about the dogma that restrained both men and women and prevented that. Um, so I don't want to monopolize, but you know, no, maybe maybe you can talk more about please, that. Please, that's yeah. well said. Yes, that's great. But you're here too. I'm uh, just. Yeah, I was. I found um, reading her work about her work and, um, very remarkable because she would. She talked about having dreams and and as she would start working on something it would go a different direction or she'd be very defined and then it would go a different direction and and I just I find her work so remarkable because it tells the whole story and and it, it gives you the details and Citra had a very direct way of being and um, and she was very clear it that was always my take on Sidra. She was very direct, she was very clear, and she just embraced. She embraced you, she embraced life, she lived life to the fullest. I, just so remarkable. Yeah, okay, so um, if 
this also relates to the struggling towards utopia and embracing everything, which everything has to be included in that sense of wholeness. Um, and the dark, the dark parts are also part of life also. And how we deal with what happens in life, I think, is what she deals with in some of her work. Because, you know, life is going to throw us things that we don't want, but how we handle them and how we deal with them um, are what determines the, you know, the quality and shape of our lives. And I think in many of her works, we see um, a reference to an archetype that is somebody who deals with it in a particular way. Um, like I was telling Joan, I never liked the idea of um, like the trickster uh, in mythology, the trickster archetype, um, you know, like the Balba figure. I never was, never was quite comfortable with it. And you know, as a kid, I loved Pippi Longstocking. I loved Robin Hood. I loved all the people that, that stood up to society that um, was corrupt in some way, but I didn't like the fact that people have to do that, but people do. And so she deals with it in some of her work, and I think really powerful ways where we see that part of the wholeness of life is being in a situation which is less than ideal, not being able to share who you are because you're concerned that you need to, um, you know, you know, for the sake of your job, there has to be some you know, restraint or many other aspects. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Many other aspects that uh, of our lives that cause us to have to be restrained. Um, and uh, I think a lot of her archetypal imagery, um, uh, well, not a lot of it, but some of it really specifically addresses those ways in which we have to deal with things that are less than ideal and shows us people like Balbo who takes a bad situation and says, basically, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> flashes her buddy and makes her buddy crack up. And then all of a sudden, that's the leveler, you know? Okay, we're girls, we can deal with this. And um, and that's, you know, not very polite, but it's how, how we deal with it when things aren't ideal. And I think, she, I think that's part of the wholeness, that she shows us that. And this is kind of a big connection to make, but I was never a big fan of Picasso, although he's, you know, a magnificent artist. But one of the things that I think is so great about him is that he deals with so many aspects of life. If you look at his art, you see everything in it. There's almost nothing in life that you don't touch on. And I think Sidra touches on so many dimensions of life. And so in one show, you see so many dimensions that can speak to us on so many different levels, and to so many of us in different ways. I wonder if you could all speak a little bit more about, we're, we're kind of getting going back and forth between feminism and what our art becomes, because it that's still there, but it becomes more than that. Um, and talking more about, um, I guess, the divine feminine, the feminine divine, and she was very interested in reclaiming female symbols, which, you know, she, done, she did a lot of research. Um, which at one point were perceived in a positive way and were then taken and twisted and corrupted, maybe became something negative. And so to me, it's like she, her journey started really with exploring that and reclaiming it and putting it in its right place. And then it, everything goes beyond that, which I'm sure we'll get to again. So maybe talk a little bit more about that, and uh, if you want to speak to some of the works that are out there that kind of address it. We don't have that many, actually. More of the earlier works, like the Minoan Snake Goddess, and some of the ones that Medusa. aren't here, Medusa. Oh, Medusa, that's another great one. Um, are some of the ones, yeah. but if you, if you could maybe speak to that a little. Well, we, we don't have a Medusa here, but <clears throat> um, Medusa has been seen in our culture as a very negative thing. The, the woman with the snakes, uh, the hair that are snakes. She um, turns men into stone, so she's a very evil thing. And she did this wonderful Medusa, and that was really a very, very positive thing. And then when I went to Sicily, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center sent me there to work on the transplant center there. And in Italy, in Sicily, their uh, icon is Medusa. And she's wonderful. She is a very healing thing. Every house has a little has a little um, a picture with Medusa in it. So what what 
um, symbols are very, very important. And reclaiming them is very important because it matters how we see something. These symbols keep um, reinforcing yes. over and over and over again. And so she did a lot of taking the symbols that had been perceived as negative in our culture and reworking them and refashioning them and reclaiming them. And often, just as I found when I went to Sicily, Medusa is not an evil person. She's a healing thing. She's a healing presence in the home. And so uh, she did a lot of that in her, in her art. And um, I don't want to, <laughs> can anyone well, else take, I don't want to yeah. take over anything. Yeah, I'm glad you yeah. said Medusa because that was my first experience mm -hmm. of seeing Medusa in a positive light was through Sidra and um, the whole idea of reclaiming these women's symbols. I had no idea whatsoever, and I have never had a women's studies course, so I had no idea how important it was within a kind of women's studies culture to reclaim things that were once women's mm -hmm. that have been um, stripped away from any connotation with femininity and kind of reassigned as, you know, societal institutions, icons for something else. So I had no idea of this. So Medusa was a real eye-opener for me. And yes, yeah, she is healing. She went through something horribly terrible. Um, but then um, society you know, shunned her. And now in our Western culture, we see her, or at least in America, we see her as a very shunned kind of negative um, image. So yes, that's right. So um, And the other icon that I had not known was the Mandorla, that you know, the, this is three stages of being a woman, and that that's basically a vagina, mm -hmm. or a womb symbol. And and we see it in all of our churches. We go to church all the time, and we see it, and it's the, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, it's the Trinity. And that's what we learn. But on Sunday, you told me, will you tell us yeah, tell again story. about that's, the Carmelites? Yeah, that was wonderful. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Well, I want to tell you first the preface on this. I, I'm on Facebook, and so someone <laughs> had posted on Facebook some vagina art. And I wrote on there, I don't go, I don't look at vagina art, I look at yoni art. And they go, yoni? What is a yoni? So the yoni is the birth canal. And if you go to any of uh, many, many, many of your icons, religious icons, you will see the Virgin Mary with the yoni and Jesus here, or even Mary and Jesus are in the birth canal because they're being birthed by God together. And so you will see that. So I went up to the Carmelite monastery after I had learned from my daughter what a yoni was versus a vagina. <laughs> which is really basically exactly the same thing. So I was talking and they had a brand new icon that one of the other Carmelites, this is the Carmelite monastery here in Montreal, and I, they had this beautiful new icon and the Virgin Mary and Jesus are in the birth canal. So I said to the nun, what is this shape here? And she said, oh, that's a yoni. <laughs> <laughs> so what it means is that we have taken a thing that is really beautiful and lovely, and we have turned it into a negative aspect. And that is what Sidra really worked hard to say. This is a thing of beauty. This is a thing of beauty. This is a... This is the birth canal, and it isn't just the birth canal in a woman's body, but it is in the birth canal in ideas, it's in our religion, it's in all, in, in all religions. It isn't just Christianity. All religions use that, that symbol. That, and I like, and I've got, I've got to put a plug in, the mandorla that's over here, that where she's taken the Templar cross, and then taken the negative space of a Templar cross, pulled it out, and made the almond cross, which is the four yonis coming together. And if you look at the Templar cross, you do have to extend it, you know, but if you look at the Templar cross, and there, you will see that she's taken the negative space of rod. Again, a thing where she's taken something negative and made it positive, and it isn't, and so um, she does this a lot. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate how she has woven in um, Native American uh, symbolism and Indian. ideas as well, and um, Indian, thank you. Uh, and, yeah. But also, 
I think of like the snakes, and you know, that's that's transformation, that's transmutation. And uh, if you start studying the the symbolism from that perspective, how much of it fits, and how she's woven that in as well. And I know she um, went to Brazil on the full break, and um, we have an audience member who uh, joined. So, um, so I just, I have a great deal of respect for Sidra and to the depth in which she, she had studied and embraced so many different levels. And we talk about, you know, the pieces walking all the way around them. They're, all of them are very totem, totem-esque. And so it takes you into another layer, another depth of who Sidra is. I have a question about the, the piece over here on the wall the, that has a trigger, 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 yeah. trigger, oh, I'm not sure how to, I've forgotten how to. Trigger, 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 So, and, 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 and it's a two-fold question. So I don't know the, the total history of the trigger, uh, and um, are those yonis, and is yoni a Sanskrit? Name? Yes. Because it sounds yes. like it's only you know, that, That's Sanskrit. a good thing. Please, please, um, uh, thank you for saying that. Yoni is a Sanskrit word. So it isn't a word. It's a word for very, very ancient uh, um, languages and ancient history. Yeah. And, and, so what, and what, is the, what is the history of, uh, you know, you said she, she, she reclaimed the tribe. Quetra. Quetra. That's, that's so what was the, the original intention of the tribe Quetra before she did her interpretation? Well, her interpretation is really, I think, the original, which is that that's what I was saying earlier without giving the specific example of the um, uh, maiden, mother, and crone, the three stages of being a woman. So um, if that was adopted. We see it in our churches, and we think it's that's a sign of the Holy Trinity. But that's actually an archetypal symbol that has to do with the wholeness of a woman from her, you know, blushing youth to you know her aging. So that's that's what that's the three stages of a woman. Of a woman, and this might be a good transition to the sacred sacred utopian. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so um, I knew she's going to ask about this. The sacred, the, the utopian sacred, the feminine sacred, so feminine. the feminine sacred, and that is that um, you know I grew up in this area, and uh, in the Western world we tend to have our sense of religion and morality really based on ideas of right and wrong and um, trying to do good, as we're supposed to. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until I was an adult. And I also um, have a lot of interest in Indian culture, which was a way that we connected. And the um, Indian notions of spirituality are so very different. And uh, the idea of creation as a union of man and woman, and with the symbol of the yoni, being not just a vagina, but the womb and the center of creativity is a really fundamental and central thing in religion, or in, in Indian religions historically. Alan was talking on Sunday about the Kaj, I can never pronounce it right, Kaja, Kaja Rado oh, temple, which is this huge temple complex with thousands and thousands of images of not deities, but regular people having sex in every way that you could imagine, <laughs> with everybody watching and kind of, you know, almost participating, and, um, yeah. and it's celebrating human sexuality as the source of life, and um, male and female coming together, and the idea of the woman as the, um, as the source of creation. So we have a mental, this is our two-sided, you know, everything has to come together to be whole, the mental potential in the deities that are male, and then the material um, in the woman who actually births it. So anything that is created, whether it's you know a scientific discovery that you're working on, or whether it's something artistic, or you know whether you're you know making dinner, it doesn't matter. Anything that you are creating has some female aspect to it because creation can't happen without a woman. 
So um, I think that comes out in her work. But that's not something that many of us are familiar with in our own sense of the sacred, that this is, that the womanness is so essential in creation. Um, we think of it, but we don't think of it as a sacred thing. But it's really honored in Indian culture, and I think she wants to bring that back to us to see that it should be honored. And you say Indian meaning India. India, India. yeah. yeah. Where, where she traveled. Versus right, where she traveled to India, yeah. And which I think really influenced her a lot. Great. Can I just, <laughs> like Carl, um, we had always wanted to have an Indian restaurant in Squirrel Hill, and we didn't. And I, I saw Carl walking down the street one day, and I said, hey, you know, Coriander opened. And he said, I know, we're going there. Sitter and Kevin and I are going there. Later, do you want to join us? And I said, oh, I can't. And, he, and you said, I think Sindra thinks that she was Indian in a past life. She's from India in a past life. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it's so true that that is um, something that comes out of her, you know. I mean, it's, it's part of who she is that these ideas are hers. They're her ideas. And, and she's giving them to us because we didn't know them before. I, I had learned so much from her in the past dozen, dozen years. What I noticed too, and I agree, the, the influence from India is very strong, and the influence from ancient symbol, symbol, symbolism is very strong. But Sutra was very aware of the symbolism everywhere. In her dreams, for one, the wolf is a great example of that, um, but also the Native American culture, and you know, when she lived there. Um, how about in Alaska as a two year old bear, and the yeah. symbolism mm -hmm. of the bear? Mm -hmm. Sidra was so, I mean, I mean, symbolism was just part of her, and, and everything just, you know, is it, she realizes the symbol of it and, and what it means. I, I don't know if yeah. any of you have anything to add. Oh, I very much relate to the symbolism on so many levels with, with the animals and, and her embracing Mother Earth and incorporating the, the totem and Having, I have gone to India, and so, in fact, she knew that I was going to India, and so at the first meeting for the Society of Sculptors after I returned, she wore her Indian outfit sorry. and sorry, and, and uh, we we shared a lot of um, passion about that. Uh, so, do you want me to go about the tree or? Yeah. Um, so when I was in the end and went to this temple, we were charged with to follow where our feet took us in this temple. And so um, I was drawn to this big tree in the temple, and it was wrapped by a red, a red cord, red string. And so the, the priest who was sitting by the tree, I tried to quiz him about what the ceremony, what the ritual was, and and he didn't know very much English, and so he would just say to me, just for men, just for men. Well, this whole temple was there to celebrate the yoni. It was celebrating the cycle. On, on the outside of the temple, it was all carved with the, the woman's figure, and um, the entire temple was about... Um, the yoni and the cycle. And so when I came to that tree and it was just for men, just for men, it was like that was the one thing I wanted to do. Well, the cord that was tied around the tree was a form of prayer. So, and when you would tie the knot in the red cord, it was the completion of the prayer. So at that point, when I came back to the United States and was had a, a sculpture that I was going to be creating for the Society of Sculptors, this tree kept coming back to my mind. And so I talked to Laura and I said, you know, I want to do this tree at the Center for the Arts and wrap red thread. And as it evolved, it was, where it was for a prayer for empowerment for women around the world. So it was a, uh, a tree that we wrapped with a number of people through meditation as a form of prayer for empowerment, and we ended up with about 24 miles of thread around this tree. 
So this was uh, something that Sidra was very much a part of. Um, she wasn't able to physically wrap, but she really joined in our celebration with this tree. What year was that? That was just last year. Last year. Last year. Last year. Um, and actually, that, that's kind of where I want to go now is kind of, and I had said this to you on Sunday and you all agreed, in looking at Sidra's art and the earlier art to her last pieces, what really struck me was that it, it changed at a certain point. And it changed in a rather beautiful way. And I said, I thought it changed in that way around the time of the diagnosis of cancer. Which may seem like an irony that out of something so cruel and ugly starts coming the, this beauty that I really start seeing in, in the sculpture. And that whole thing with the symbolism, um, it starts to really almost disappear into what she's working on and become an integral part of it and it flows and so <laughs> You had all said that, yeah, you saw the change. So I'd like you to speak a little bit about that and also the technique, because I am I do notice also with the carving and the way she treats the terracotta. Uh, you spoke a little bit about it earlier still with the glazes, but I think that changes too in many ways. There's a refinement that begins to happen. So you could all speak to that a little bit. Well, I, I find it to be more elegant and passion and the want and the desire, it just seems to escalate. And But I keep on coming back to this courage, courageous, and honest, and but there's this beautiful refinement. And, and when I look at Sidra, it just reflects exactly that time period. But it's just, it's like breathtaking. There's just something more than energy or feelings and, and what she wanted to achieve and give. She's such a giving person. I just think that's the changes that I see. I, Seal, on Sunday you talked about um, some of the conversations that you had with Sidra about why, you know, Sidra debated whether to go with the raw clay right. or could yeah. you share some? Well, we, we went back and forth and back and forth between that. Um, she just thought she might want to uh, put more colors in it with oxides and terra sigillata, which is a colored earth seal, which would be in between. But every time that she would try it, she'd always have to come back to the honesty of the raw clay, and you don't always need color. Uh, um, you can show the texture that shows emotion, and it, it was just, there wasn't a need for the color. And, and, and um, she was in a show I had uh, ages ago for the national conference at my school, and uh, it was a woman's show, it was called A Woman's Vision. But that, that was probably, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And what's come out of that afterwards, there's just no question about any color. She knew, and she wanted to show it honestly, elegantly, passionately, courageously. Um, you know, it all, of course, brings tears to our eyes how, how courageous she was. I know you've got something. I think if there's, if there's any gift that um, knowing that you're terminally ill gives you is that you get really honest with who you are very, very fast. And um, I, my perception is that she, in the art especially, you know, after she knew that um, where she was probably going, not knowing how long it would be, that that she decided to just let it all out and not be afraid to show what was happening. And I would contend that while my daughter is unabashedly a feminist artist, that she is the new feminist. 
and um, the new feminist speaks for all of humanity, but through a woman's eyes. That's the only difference. It's saying, this is my perspective through a female eyes. But it is the human condition. And if you look at those pieces, she is really, especially the ones that you pointed out, as, as she knew uh, this, the, she didn't know how much longer she had to live. And she, uh, that she was really letting, telling you the story of the human life. It isn't just a female story, it's a human story. And uh, she, all of the figures are female, but don't males struggle with the female inside them and what the female wants to tell them? Honest men do, I think. At least I've heard men say that <laughs> to me. Um, that, and and the, the parts of themselves and that legacy. So I, I would challenge you to just look at it as the human condition, not just as a woman's condition. Just the eyes of a woman, but it's the human condition. And she was just honest. And that's maybe one of the things that when you know that you only have, someone always says you ought to live like this is the last day of your life. But we don't do that. We hold death at a distance. And she came to the point where she could no longer hold death at a distance, and so she had to face what she was going to give for the last days and months and stuff that she had to her family and to her art. And to all of us. Yeah. It's been and a to gift. All of us. It's been a gift. But she gave. I would love to have questions. I was just yeah. about may to I, say that. Can I share something about that after yes. documenting her life or her, her, her artwork? Um, Sid was one of my best friends and a uh, real kindred spirit. And, you know, she was there. She was there. Six months could go by. She was there. And it was unspoken. And when I interviewed her, I worked for a hospice for three years. So I have that experience. When I was with Sidra, as a matter of fact, the last time, if you've seen the video, the last time I interviewed her was on Carl's 50th birthday. And I would challenge everyone, because she has challenged me, aren't we all dying? You know, do, our, do we know our number of days? We really don't. And she dared to be real. And as I stood by her bedside three years ago, I thought, this is it. She's not pulling out of this. And she did. Because she wasn't done. She had something to say. And don't we all have something to say? And if we, I mean, she just challenges me. Doggone you, Sidra. You know, she just does. We, you know, I told her that. And no matter what, she would always turn it around, too, because you'd go to her to comfort her, and she would turn it around. She just had a way of just always, you know, challenging you. And, and I just really am, am proud of her work. I'm, I'm so proud to be her friend. And I am working on a document documentary, so keep your eyes out. It'll be on her website as this develops. So, But I just wanted to share that three years. I think. She wasn't finished, and I, I sensed, if it gives anyone peace, if they haven't seen the interview, I sensed a real peace in my last interview with her that she had come to terms as best she could, given the situation, she had a lot of peace, and she had come to terms because she had said what she was put here to say. And my brother comforted me by saying, now you have to do the same thing. So it's like a domino effect, you know. So we have to let Citra be our domino, you know. So that it just, everything that comes out of this room, be it the spoken word or something creative. But anyway, thank you. I want to hear some questions. Yeah, does anybody have any questions specifically while we're still sitting here? But I'm also thinking probably most of us want to get up and move a little as well after we've taken a few questions. And everybody's going to linger, I think, close to Sidra's works to talk more in there, which I think I'd wonderful. But we have questions. There's a question back there. Yep. Yes? Um, I'm 
I'm looking at Sidra's work and uh, you, the themes of feminism are constant in this work that we see here. Um, what is missing is the anger of the feminism that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And I really like mm -hmm. that instead of anger, what you see is action toward yes. sort of resolution. That's the new feminist. Which, mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, the new I feminist. really see that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but I, so I wanted to just put that out there that you know, not seeing anger, which you have seen in the past in feminist women's art, and you don't see that. Can I, can I say, Sivir was probably one of the most positive people I've ever met. She never, she, Ellen touched on it, but she would all, she just, negativity was not, she said it's useless. It's just plain useless. When she would begin to feel that way, we all have it, and she went through that too. But when she would say, I, I came to realize it's useless, now I want to be positive. And all of those works out there, I feel, some of her early stuff wasn't positive. You're not seeing the beginning of her, of her journey. But when, when she, at what point she made that turn, and I think it was the diagnosis with cancer, that when she made that turn, she began to say, I want to just make a positive. I'm working toward, and I like it, it's struggling. We're struggling toward utopia. This isn't anything that's going to come over to look at us. I mean, but... But that was her desire, and she projected that. And the other thing that one of the other artists, Duncan McDermott, said to me, and I don't know this, and maybe you can know, he said, her, her palette, you talk about a palette of an artist's palette. He said her palette was, um, was warm and positive. She worked in a warm and positive palette. So that when you see things like death, like struggle, you will not be, you won't have a negative feeling because she worked in a positive palette. And it's, it's that raw, that's part of it. It's the way it is molded. It is the way that, that it's done. It's not, you know, so that the, even the ports that are, that are angular, it moves into flowing. Even when there's angular, it moves into flowing. And you'll notice in that one, in that one piece where um, she's standing in front of the structure. Now that structure can be an institutional church. It can be the hospital. It can be any, any structure in, in society that that structure holds us. These are not negative things. They hold us. The church holds us. The churches hold us. The synagogues, the, they hold us. The, the hospitals hold us, but they are also confining. They are also working against it, so there's that struggle. And then you look through her body to the joy that is within herself. You know, you see that if you peek in, you have to look through her body to see it. Her riding the horse, the stallion that she was given while she was on the Navajo reservation. They gave her, she lived in a Hogan. Only, only my daughter. Only my daughter could have done this, right, Carl? Once a week, they were given a, a you had to go out and get your own water, you know, you didn't have, there weren't wells, you had to go out to a well way far away, and you brought in the water, and she would bathe herself in this pan, that's all she had, and then she bathed her horse, when <laughs> she washed the horse that she would take out when she went into the desert that they gave her. But anyway, um, so look through that structure, because the structures hold us, they can find us, but they also hold us. Yeah, and just a question about technique. Yeah, I don't know that I can, on but that, I have this on wonderful that artist here. piece mm -hmm. where you know, there's the building and then there's a mirror in the back yeah. of it, and that enables you to see what she's put on the back of yeah. the figure. Um, do you know whether she had that total conception in mind when she started the piece? She and, did. Or, or the other side would be that it, she started with a, a smaller aspect and then it evolved. And, no. no. No, that was one of the pieces I know that she had that concept. I will have to tell you that that structure was made by Duncan, the structure on the thing. He did that for her. Who's that? And so 